Good morning, everyone. Greetings and welcome to today's session. My name is Justin Bush, and I'm the coordinator of the Washington Invasive Species Council. As background, the council was created by our state legislature in 2006, and it is tasked with policy level direction, planning, and coordination for combating harmful invasive species throughout the state, as well as preventing others that may be harmful. We'll go ahead and start with some housekeeping. A recorded version of the webinar will be available and hosted online in the near future. Once it is available, we'll email you a link. And um, feel free to use the chat box to ask questions at any time during the presentation, um, but everyone will be muted. Following the presentation, we will have a live question and answer period. If you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and we'll unmute you, or feel free to type the question in the chat box and we can read it to our speaker today. Just a note, we will be monitoring the chat box throughout the webinar to help with troubles or to answer questions. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce everyone to Washington Pest Watch. And this is the first webinar in a series of webinars and in-person trainings led by agencies and universities that are the front line in protecting our state's natural resources and economy from invasive species. We call this network Washington Pest Watch. We have uh, upcoming webinar trainings that you see here, as well as upcoming in-person trainings. And you don't have to actively search for invasive species, be an entomologist or a biologist to participate in Washington Pest Watch. We're asking everyone to keep an eye out in their yards, their neighborhoods, or when they're outdoors uh, recreating. Be aware and report what you spot. It's really that simple and easy. Within Washington, we know how to detect and stop invasive species, but we need your help. Be mindful of new invaders, such as those that you'll be hearing about uh, by our presenter today. I'd like to introduce everyone to Washington Pest Watch. And this is the first webinar in a series of webinars and in-person trainings led by agencies and universities that are the front line in protecting our state's natural resources and economy from invasive species. We call this network Washington Pest Watch. We have uh, upcoming webinar trainings that you see here, as well as upcoming in-person trainings. And you don't have to actively search for invasive species, be an entomologist or a biologist to participate in Washington Pest Watch. We're asking everyone to keep an eye out in their yards, their neighborhoods, or when they're outdoors uh, recreating. Be aware and report what you spot. It's really that simple and easy. Within Washington, we know how to detect and stop invasive species, but we need your help. Be mindful of new invaders, such as those that you'll be hearing about uh, by our presenter today. I'm pleased to introduce Rachel Bomberger, who is our presenter. Rachel is the Plant Diagnostician and Diagnostics Coordinator for the Washington State University Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic. Rachel Bomberger received a Bachelor of Science in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology from University of California, Santa Cruz, and received her Master's of Science in Botany and Plant Pathology from Oregon State University. After graduating, Rachel worked as the diagnostician for the Nevada Department of Agriculture. In 2015, Rachel became the plant diagnostician for Washington State University's newly reopened Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic in Pullman, Washington. At the Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic, Rachel provides diagnosis on all manner of plant health problems, including the detection of fungi, viruses, bacteria, and nematode-caused diseases, anthropod pests, as well as abiotic disorders. And with that, I'll let Rachel take it from here. Thanks, everyone. My name is Rachel, as Justin said, and I run the WSU Plant Pest Diagnostic Clinic. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about invasive plant diseases as part of an effort for the Washington Pest Watch and Washington Invasive Species Council. I'm also one of the National Plant Diagnostic Laboratories for the state of Washington, along with Jenny Glass at the WSU Puyallup Research and Extension Center, and as well as the Plant Pathology Lab with uh, Washington State Department of Agriculture. So we're here to help um, first detectors, green industry, master gardeners, um, when they find something of concern. So, today I'm going to talk briefly about sudden oak death, two other invasive Phytophthora diseases, Phytophthora carinoviae, 
and Phytophthora ulni, as well as thousand canker disease. And then we're gonna finish it up with kind of an oldie but a goodie, white pine blister rust, which is an important um, invasive species in our region. So before we get to talk about diseases, uh, we need to launch into what the recipe for disease is. Now, there's reason there's a triangle for those of you who are geometrically inclined. Um, we have three key parts to this recipe. We need a host plant, a disease-causing organism called a pathogen, and the right environment. And we must have all three of these ingredients for disease to happen. If we don't have all three, disease will not progress. So there are different ways that we can make a plant susceptible. Sometimes certain plants have different genetics and that will make them more or less susceptible to infection by certain pathogens. And this can also mean they might be resistant or tolerant to different diseases. And this will come up in a couple of our disease scenarios. Um, we also have some plants that have been bred to be more or less resistant to different pathogens and as well as diseases. Um, and we have different plants that are only susceptible at certain stages in their life, such as seedlings or when they're nearing the end of their life cycle or when they're flowering or fruiting, that sort of thing. Now, the flip side of that is there are certain pathogens that based on their genetics are able to cause disease only on certain plants. So that's kind of the flip side of a susceptible host. We do have virulent pathogens that are only allowed to attack certain plants. Um, pathogens, another important caveat to this is the fact that they can out evolve a plant's defense. They reproduce and change their genetics much faster than a host plant is able to change and become develop new defenses. And then the third part, which is actually the part most people forget, but it is one of the most important parts, and especially in an invasive situation, is a conducive environment. What a conducive environment can do is it can either wink at a plant, you know, if we have drought conditions, um, severe frost damage, it can make strong plants weak. It can make them more susceptible. And then vice versa, if we have certain environmental conditions, let's say it's been rainy or mild, much more mild temperatures than we're used to at a certain time of year, it can actually give the pathogen an upper hand into the ability to infect a tree. So that was really a run of the mill disease triangle. That's what most diseases need to happen. Now, when we have an invasive disease triangle, everything shifts because we're now in a situation where the disease has the upper hand. Um, in a typical disease scenario, it's about equal. All three sides are about equal, but with the invasive disease triangle, uh, the disease gets an upper hand because there's no host resistance. Usually the plant hasn't been um, kind of in a constant battle with that pathogen for long enough to develop resistance or mechanisms for defending itself against the particular pathogen. Um, there's no natural enemies to the pathogen or antagonists or worthy competitors. And besides trying to be funny, I added that in there because really in this microbe environment, uh, we have microbes that aren't negatively impacting trees or plants that take up space that the pathogen also wants to occupy. So with the lack of these microbes, um, we see that the pathogen is able to take up that niche in the plant and then again, cause disease. And then lastly, um, which really seems to drive a lot of our invasive dis plant diseases is that the environment encourages disease. There's something about the weather or the climate or the conditions in these new areas that the disease gets introduced that really encourages disease. Okay, and with that, we're gonna jump into our first invasive disease, um, sudden oak death. I don't know if anyone speaks Greek, but if you did, you would see that the word phytophthora, when broken down, actually means plant destroyer. Every now and then scientists can actually be funny and a little bit descriptive. Um, the genera of phytophthora is made up of a lot of different plant pathogens. We'll end up focusing on three of these today. Um, three invasives today, but even when they're not invasive, this is a group of organisms that can cause a lot of damage on plants. Uh, it was responsible for the Irish potato famine, a lot of root rots, 
Um, it can affect trees, vegetables, flowers, shrubs, and crops. Um, but interestingly enough, Phytophthora and its relatives Pythium and Downy Mildew are not actually true fungi. They're actually water molds, uh, um, which is actually indicative of a key part of their life cycle for the pathogen. So the disease Phytophthora morum, or sudden oak death, which I might abbreviate on occasion to SOD, was first noticed in Germany and the Netherlands, and then around the same time in Central California, about the mid-1990s. Since the mid-1990s, over a hundred, or excuse me, a million plants, trees, have been killed in California due to this disease, um, where it has been established in both landscapes and forested areas, um, including botanics and oaks. As you can see in this photo by Sarah Navarro, there's a lot of extensive dieback. All of those dead trees are remnants of that disease sweeping through. So a bit about this pathogen is that it needs two different mating types to reprodu reproduce and spread sexually. That's what the word heterothallic means. Um, we call them A1 and A2. So there's different lineages. This is just some fancy science talk. Um, there's a European lineage that is mating type A1, and then a North American 1 and North American 2 that are mating type A2. Really, the reason we talk about this is because when there is sexual reproduction, it changes how the disease can pro progress as well as how it can survive. Hopefully, y'all can see my cursor, but what we're looking at in this top photo is called an oospore. And it's a double-walled structure that allows that uh, pathogen to survive long-term in soil. So that means it can exist for years without the right environmental conditions and without the right host. So this is why these diseases can be very terrifying, because it can exist for a long time and kind of remain quiet or dormant until the right conditions or the right host come about. Um, so far, we have not actually found oospores, but as we'll see at the very end of this section, there is some cause for concern. However, we do have a sexual structure called chlamydospores, and that's what we see in this bottom photo. While they're not double-walled structures, they are melanized, which means they darken to protect themselves, just kind of like um, our skin has melanin to protect us from UV rays. These structures are then melanized so that they can also survive in harsh conditions and soil climates. Um, until there's the right environment and the host is present. So, Phytophthora morm requires water for part of its life cycle and only part. Um, so these, those oospores and chlamydospores that we saw on the last slide, they will actually germinate to form sporangia, um, and that is this structure here. Um, this is the part of the life cycle that requires water, as once the sporangia is formed in the presence of water, it will actually release swimming spores that we call zoospores. That's what we see in the bottom here that's been released from a sporangia. Um, and this is really concerning because these can actually swim towards roots and towards plants. Um, and they're also able to move through soil and water so then they can find those fine roots of the plants and initiate infection. These are also what will germinate on leaf surfaces that can then be spread into the canopies of trees um, more on that in a little bit. So this germination infection process is the only part that requires water, um, which is why this is such a problematic issue for, in the nursery trade um, and homeowner situations, because we're able to actually create microclimates that allow this part of the life cycle to take place. So this is the proposed disease cycle for Phytophthora morum in forest. So the fungus is introduced to the canopy of, say, California bay laurel. It's able to sporulate depending on the time of year and the conditions. And then this can either spread to different leaves within the plant or be washed down to the trunk as well as the fine roots in the soil um, where the infection process will take place. The other thing that can happen is it will drop down to understory plants, and understory plants play an important role in sudden oak death as they are hosts that don't die outright from the pathogen, but they can 
cause infection of these other trees that do die and succumb very quickly to this disease. So I mentioned that there are different types of hosts. Primarily, as the name implies, oaks are a species that are very heavily affected by this disease. Not all species of oaks are infected by sudden oak death. Um, and it's not just oaks affected. Conifers, larch, um, I don't think anyone from the UK is joining us, but the heathlands uh, species, maples, ashes, even ferns, which are a very uh, genetically distant related plant species, sequoia, lilac, magnolium, rhododendron, beech, viburnum. There's 46 known hosts at this time that can either be a foliar host, so these understory plants, or be one of the tree hosts that tend to actually die from these cankers. Um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of these plants are also very desirable ornamental plants. So this is why we have this issue with the nursery industries, uh, horticulture, green industry, as well as homeowners. And to complicate matters even further, we have 100 plus regulated nursery species. So this means the USDA APHIS goes in, as well as WSDA, um, and other departments of agri state departments of agriculture go in and inspect nursery plants and have found it sun oak death on over a hundred plant species um, and they're not truly being infected by this sun oak death but they are able to move the disease so that becomes concerning because if nursery trade can move these plants around very very quickly um, so what we see up top here is an example of some of the California oak, um, oak forests, and then below some of the foliar damage that can happen to plants like rhododendron and viburnums and azalea. So there are different categories of hosts and the damage associated with these hosts. So our foliar hosts are often understory shrubs and woody ornamentals. Um, Camellia, rhododend rhododendron, and viburnums are the ones that get a lot of attention. While these plants don't die, they do get leaf blight as well as defoliation and shoot dieback, with the young leaves being most susceptible. Now, while these aren't outright killing the plants, you would see a pretty drastic reduction in vigor if there's a big infection that's taken up a lot of leaf tissue because as plants lose leaf tissue, they lose the ability to photosynthesize. So if they can't make food, they are going to have poor vigor. Um, important things to note is that a lot of infections tend to happen near the margins or the tips of the leaves. And that's because that's where water pools most frequently. And so that's where infection is able to take place easiestly. Um, so we always, uh, you know, check the underside of the leaves when you see leaf spots to make sure it's gone all the way through. There's a lot of issues like sunburn and abiotic disorders that only affect the tops of the leaves, whereas sun oak death would be an infection that you could see on both top and bottom. Again, it's important to check the tips of the leaves where water tends to collect. And then shoot dieback is this final photo here that we can see that is quite uh, a drastic symptom for these foliar hosts. And again, these foliar hosts are the ones that are able to reproduce the spores um, of the fungus, or and move it on to these trees that then get stem infections. These are mostly our tree species, including oaks, beech, dogwood, true firs, and dug firs. Um, these conifers get slightly different infections. They will get needle bites most characteristically, and then die back, but there can be some stem-based infections as well. So it happens when an understory plant then infects a tree, we often see that the roots will get infested directly or rain or other precipitation may move the spores down into the fine roots of these trees, which then allows the pathogen to enter into the plant's vascular tissue, where it can spread to the root crown and stem, creating these stem lesions we see here. These usually lower down on the tree. Um, in the canopy, we'll see flagging, which is just where a couple of branches start to become discolored, um, may turn yellow in some of these deciduous trees, whereas conifers, you'd see needle blight and then die back. Um, death and then bleeding cankers often, which is kind of what we see here, and we'll see better examples. Um, host response 
will vary based on the species. You know, there's 46 different species and many different tree species that are affected. So their response to this pathogen is slightly different, except the fact that they're going to be showing vascular symptom stress. So there's an interruption of the flow of nutrients and water to the plant. So this is an example of what the bleeding cankers can look like. What we see in the top is more what we call a rust spot. So where there's red discoloration on the bark that is abnormal for the plant. As always, you need to know what normal looks like for a plant. Um, I've never seen a plant that has quite this discoloration on its bark. That's very, very red. And then there's almost an extremely graphic looking bleeding discoloration um, coming from the trunk of this tree. Now, this is very, very much a tree's cry for help that something has gone terribly wrong. Um, and if you were to take a knife and cut into the bark underneath this tree, this is what you would see. Now, there are certain species of uh, trees that are affected that have kind of a red vascular tissue, but not all of them do. And we start to see this discoloration in the vascular tissue. And I will tell you right now, that does not take up water and nutrients the right way. So now this tree is limited to how much water and nutrients it's providing to its canopy. So when you dig into those rust colored spots, those bleeding lesions, you will see this sharp discoloration from the healthy tissue. So the environment, again, this is that crucial third side of the triangle that is really important for the development of disease. This pathogen requires water for infection and completion of its life cycle. And we pointed out those spores that can remain dormant until wet conditions and presence of the host. So it can sit and chill out until it's the right time that will allow infection to take place. Now the scary part is once infected, environmental conditions matter less. And again, this is that troubling point for nursery trade or plant trade because plants can become infected in the nursery environment and then be shipped to places like Nevada. When I was in Nevada, we would do sudden oak death uh, nursery inspections because if infection happened in a state or in a place where there was an environment that was conducive towards sudden oak death, as long as that infection has been underway and that pathogen is safe inside of the plant, um, it doesn't matter that it goes to an arid state after that. Um, this pathogen prefers moderate temperature and moist environments, so that means it's most active March through June and September through October. Now, years like this in 2017 are great phytophthora weather. This is how I judge the climate, whether or not it's good or bad for certain pathogens. Sometimes it's a fusarium southern summer, other times it's a sudden oak death spring. So unfortunately, we've had a lot of very wet and mild conditions recently. So these are very conducive for um, Phytophthora in general, including sudden oak death. So going back to nurseries, these nurseries again can create artificial microenvironments because plants need water for proper growth. So with that supplemental water, there could be room for infection to take place. And then another issue that pops up with nursery industries is that water can be recycled for use later. And because this is a particular pathogen that can survive in water, that means the pathogen can then get into the water system and then be spread throughout the nursery. Luckily, we haven't seen this happen, but it is one of those concerning factors in why sudden oak death uh, remains on our radar. Now, I always make a point to talk about lookalikes because what makes identifying invasive plant, plant species so difficult is that we're often relying on just a few symptoms and symptom development and expression. So the way I want people to think of this is think of all of the things that can cause a headache. You could be sick, you might not have had enough water, you could have been in the sun too long, you could have had too much fun the night before, or you've been stuck on a webinar with me for three hours. Any of those things can cause a headache, which is just a symptom. So it's important to keep in mind when you see these plants that look like they're struggling, that there are lookalikes. There's other pathogens, including other Phytophthora species, not just the sudden oak death pathogen that can damage all of these hosts. Uh, low temperatures, sunburn, 
this photo up here is actually an ash tree that has been sunburned so bad it started to weep. So a lot of things can cause weeping cankers. Um, there's abiotic root rot, something we also see when there's beneficial phytophthora conditions, is uh, waterlogged soils choke the roots because there's no oxygen available for these plants. So we can see abiotic root rot that would result in vascular stress looking plants. Uh, mechanical damage, uh, extreme weather, girdling, chemical injury, and fertilizer burn can all produce some symptoms that look like sudden oak death damage. For example, here's what sun scald can look like on trees, as well as cold injury to plants. And you can see there's a drastic demarcation from this healthy tissue to this dead tissue. You know, this is actually kind of the reverse of what we'd expect to see with Phytophthora. Most Phytophthora we expect near the roots to be what's discolored, but there's still a very drastic discoloration that can look very much like Phytophthora. Verticillium wilt is another fungal disease that can produce some flagging and branch dieback, which could be confusing. Um, as well as here is a maple infected with Phytophthora cactorum. You can see rust spots as well as bark splits that are common for sudden oak death, as well as once you've dug into the vascular tissue, here we have healthy tissue with a sharp demarcation between infected tissue. So this is very much the same symptom progression we'd expect with sudden oak death, yet it is a different Phytophthora entirely. Um, here is rhododendron with abiotic damage, which we still see this tips that are more discolored and then um, certain margins. And this lesion actually goes from top to bottom. So unfortunately, there are a lot of lookalikes. That can make diagnosis a little difficult, but it's important to be able to recognize abiotic versus biotic symptoms. Uh, generally with abiotic, if all of the plants in a certain area look infected the same, that starts to bring up the clue that maybe it's not a pathogen that's causing damage. Um, but if you were in a nursery system, home system, you could see that the plant actually has fewer feeder roots because these are what are targeted first by the pathogen and then they're lost. The bleeding clankers with that very dark red to brown to black exudate. Um, those are slightly unique for some oak death as well as other phytophthoras. Rust spots as well, that red discoloration on the bark. But keep in mind, different species will have different responses. Um, leaf spots, the tips and the mid veins will be where most of the infection is occurring. And this discoloration should be on both the top and the bottom. So depending on what your job is, how you interact with the green industry, you might be coming across a lot of plants that look symptomatic. Um, and if that were the case, they do actually sell commercial field kits. Um, these are lateral flow devices. Sometimes they're called dipsticks. And they actually work much the same as pregnancy tests where you take infected plant material, you grind it up in a mesh pouch that's provided, and then you insert this dicks dipstick and you'll get two lines if the phytophthora genera is there um, and one line indicating the test work. Now unfortunately this only works for the entire genera of phytophthora. Um, it'll also pick up a few pythiums but it would tell you if there is a phytophthora pythium present. Um, these have to be confirmed via molecular techniques. These pathogens are so similar that even microscopically, they can be difficult to tell apart. So they need to go in for DNA testing, um, which WSDA can provide um, and is one of our nationally registered labs to do so. So a few updates, there are regulation for moving host plants of sudden oak death in Washington state. Um, WSDA does a lot of monitoring. They've done a wonderful job keeping on top of this situation. And they've had no positive fines in 2017. I believe they're probably continuing their inspections in 2018. Some other contacts besides myself and Washington for this are Jennifer Fallacy with WSDA Plant Pathology, Gary Chastagner with WSU Research and Extension Center in Puyallup, as well as Amy Ramsey, who is the DNR plant pathologist. So if anyone's from Oregon in early 2015, we did actually detect the other mating type in tan oak. Unfortunately, this is a more aggressive um, 
more aggressive mating type that can attack and kill conifers. And unfortunately, it means that there can be sexual reproduction, which allows the pathogen, if we were able to come up with any defense systems, can allow it to break that faster. Um, so far, we have not actually observed any of the O-spores in either Europe or the US at this point. Um, if you happen to be in Oregon, your contacts there are Sarah Navarro with uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry, as well as Jennifer Park with Oregon State University. So now moving into a second Phytophthora species, there's a lot of similarities as far as host's life cycle as well as the environment requirements. Um, so if any of you, again, if we <laughs> somehow have folks from the UK, um, this is actually found in Cornwall, which is indicated by the species name Cernovier, which is the old name for Cornwall of Kernow. I find new things out every time I make presentations. Um, this was found in 2003, and it was associated with beech and rhododendrons in both gardens and wooden areas. Um, like sun oak death, this is a disease that has both an understory plant component as well as a tree component. Um, with bleeding stem cankers usually found on the beech trees. The other hosts were things like vaccinium, um, vacciniums or mountain cranberries, bearberries, as well as they actually found this particular Phytophthora on the custard apple fruit as well as soil in um, radiata pine plantings in New Zealand. So this is a pathogen that they're not only finding in these more typical intersections between wooded and garden areas, but also in forestry plantings, as well as orchards. So here are two photos of, again, those bleeding or rust spot stem infections on these trees. So you can see the ivy is around down here, which is another um, understory plant that can cause infection and after removing some of the bark you will start to see the staining discoloration and it's a very sharp margin between this very sick tissue and some of this less infected healthy tissue. Here we see the tip dieback and leaf infection of different plant species and again these are the understory plants where the pathogen is then able, when it comes in contact in water, again, most often along the mid vein or at the tip of the leaf, um, is actually able to create sporangia that then release spores that can then initiate those stem infections um, and serve as inoculum for tree infection. So the third Phytophthora we're going to talk about is Phytophthora alni. This is causing root and collar rot in alder. Um, it was first recovered in Britain in 1993, and this is about roughly the same time as the sudden oak death was happening in Germany, Netherlands, and the U.S. Um, and so far, Phytophthora alni has been reported in most European countries. It is a riparian disease um, because most alders are commonly grown along waterways, as well as anywhere that they're doing commercial alder plantings. Um, so though it is a riparian inhabiting pathogen, it can actually be found many ways away from an actual riparian area. This is due to the fact that this is a pathogen that can survive in both water and soil. So it's not hard to think that the soil and water movement can move it quite far away. This pathogen has been found in Alaska, um, but not killing plants. There are three different variations of if you will, um, variants of this fungi, or see now I've confused myself, this fungus-like organism, um, but we haven't found one in Alaska that has been killing the alders, it has been found in the soil. In Oregon, there have been limited root lesions found on red alder. Um, unlike sudden oak death and Phytophthora carinovia, this pathogen actually prefers warmer and slower moving water usually kind of a fine soil, more like a clay loam. The symptoms that we see with these alders are usually occurring in the mid to late summer. This is pretty common with plants that are infected by a vascular pathogen because plants put more stress on their vascular system when they need more water and nutrients from both 
being hotter in temperature and being um, needing to grow and develop. So we see unthrifty, which can mean small, yellow, or sparse leaves in the canopy. Um, dieback will occur if infections happened over multiple years and more of that, more and more of that vascular system has been compromised. And a third symptom that we see in the mid to late summer is heavy cone production. This is a fairly common stress related symptom because the plant has been given cues that it's going to die soon. So it wants to reproduce as fast as possible. Like the other Phytophthoras, we do see rusty spots on these trees and we can find them up to three meters off the ground, um, which is pretty far up for a lot of these stem infections where they're usually closer to the ground um, for both Sunnota and Phytophthora carinobi. So here's an example of those rusty brown discolorations and with some bleeding. Now, cutting, removing that bark tissue, we can see the healthy tissue along with the clear delineation between this infected brown um, and red discolored tissue, very indicative of fungal and omycete infection. Okay, now we're gonna move off of our phytophthoras to talk about thousand cankers disease. So, thousand cankers disease attacks walnut species, particularly the black walnuts are what are most affected by this particular disease. Um, this is, disease is a result of a true fungus pathogen called Geosmithia morbidida. Um, an odd thing about this is typically the pathogens in the genera Geosmithia are fairly weak. They're not known to cause extensive dieback and death, but for whatever reason, this Geosmithia morbidida is causing very extensive dieback on black walnuts. And to make things even more confusing, I'm now taking our beloved disease triangle and turning it into a disease square because there is a fourth component to this disease, the walnut twig beetle. Um, this disease is currently in many Western states. An, an odd thing about this is this disease system is actually native to the Southwest US, meaning the Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico, as well as the Chihuahuan Desert region in Mexico. Um, where there actually is a native walnut, the Arizona walnut, as well as the insect and pathogen, but they're not causing this extensive dieback that we've been seeing um, in the more Northern areas of the West. And part of that has to do with the fact that black walnuts have been very extensively planted in many regions as ornamental trees. So in Nevada, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, and Colorado, we have found um, very extensive dieback on walnuts due to this thousand cankers disease. This has to do again because it's outside of endemic walnut species range. So they're infecting our black walnuts that we've moved in here as ornamental plants. Um, and unfortunately, it's also been confirmed in Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, and Italy. This becomes very concerning because in the Eastern US, black walnuts are a key part of a lot of their ecosystems. Um, so if we have this devastating disease, there's very large concern um, that we'll have extensive dieback. So this beetle is the vector of the disease. It's a very tiny insect. As you can see, it's 10 adults fit on Abe Lincoln's head. Um, again, it is native to the Southwest US and Mexico where it infests native Arizona walnuts, but we don't see the rapid death. We see it acting more as a secondary invader, so it's invading trees after they've already been stressed out, either water, um, drought, poor planting, they've trees that have been infested or stressed out by some other factor, the twig beetle then moves in and will cause some branch death, but it does not cause the extensive tree dieback. The beetle alone does not actually kill the tree. It might lose a few branches, but it's this combination of the beetle and the fungus that is very um, devastating. And for those of you who might be entomologically inclined, this is a typical red-brown bark beetle. 
Its larva is generally white and C-shaped found in the phloem of the plant. So the adult beetle bores into trees and lay eggs. Here we can actually see the holes left by the adults. Um, they're tiny. Think about how tiny those beetles were on Abe Lincoln's head. The tip of some mechanical pencils are about the width and diameter of these. Um, so when the adult beetle bores into the trees and lays eggs, it'll simultaneously introduce fungal spores. And then what happens is chemical signals are released that can attract more beetles to that particular branch, tree, or stem, which then is how thousand canker disease gets its name. And then small lesions or discolorations, what we call cankers, form what these fungal spores have infected. So this is what a gallery looks like up close. Adults, whoop, adults will go perpendicular to the grain, whereas larva will go parallel with the grain. Um, you can see the size difference of these different tunnel uh, galleries. So the adults then leave the tree and then the beetles cause damage from feeding, which stresses the tree, but it does not kill the tree or kill the branches. But unfortunately, they do leave behind fungal spores and the resulting infection is really what starts to clog up the vascular system, resulting in more and more stress to the tree. Um, so adult beetles can emerge from these logs. Um, and here, this photo I think is really amazing. Um, these are two 18 inch logs and walnut twig beetles will continuously reinfest until the cambium is completely consumed of a tree. So from two 18 inch logs, a total of 23,040 beetles were recovered um, in approximately 36 square inches of cambium area. So again, this is a beetle that can reinfest an, an amazing amount. I mean, I don't know how, I just want everyone to picture how small in reality, uh, two 18 inch pieces of branches would be, and to get over 23,000 beetles is terrifying. So here we can see multiple entry and exit holes from the beetle along with the canker. That's that discoloration. It almost looks like a bruise onto the bark um, associated with these insect holes. And after cutting shallowly, unfortunately you have to cut very shallow because this insect does not infest further than the cork cambium. So it barely, barely gets into the sapwood of a tree. But if you took a knife and cut through, what you would see is a kind of oval or football shaped discoloration that's yellowish to gold and then progresses into a dark brown. So again, what's common for fungal infections is the sharp delineation between healthy tissue and infection tissue. And as the disease progresses, it gets more and more brown. And then just look at the number of entry and exit holes associated with um, this plant infection. So this fungus has actually been consistently associated with the beetle. And it's to the point where we now assume if you see galleries, frass, or the insect itself, you can assume that that fungus is present as well. And unlike an ambrosia beetle or other beetles that can move fungi around. There's no actual specialized part to this beetle to hide the fungus. It has just been consistently associated. People are still working to figure out, you know, how the fungus and the beetle interact. Here we can actually see the fungal mycelium that is that kind of white powdery growth inside the galleries. Um, so again, every time they found the beetle or the galleries or the frass, there has been fungal spores associated with this. Now what makes this disease system so terrifying in this black walnuts and these non-native um, non-native walnuts to the southwest uh, US and Mexico is the fact that this fungus, the beetle will leave eventually, but that fungus is left behind and that's what will again spread and start girdling the plant by clogging up all of its um, ability to transport water and nutrients. So these are actually the trunks of trees that have been cut down due to thousand canker disease and all we're left behind is with this stained wood 
indicating fungal infection. So the fungal cankers disrupt the movement of nutrients through the trees. This results, unfortunately, in yellowing, which is a very common symptom in plants anytime there is an interruption in nutrient movement. Um, we also see canopy thinning, branch dieback and mortality, as well as cankers. So the fungus initially is in the phloem and then spreads to the cambium layers. This becomes a bigger and bigger issue where these girdling effects because of the colas lessing cankers. So again, every time an insect infests a new part of the branch, that's a new fungal infection as well. So eventually those fungi, fungal infections grow into each other, absolutely clogging up the plant. Um, they've actually seen a two meter large canker resulting from these infections. And unfortunately, these symptoms are very hard to notice. Um, you tend to not notice when a plant has one insect infection or one fungal infection, one canker. You don't see the damage until there's multiple infestations. And really, once the canopy issues are noticed, it could be as little as two to three years before this tree dies. And we don't have a way to stop this disease progression once it's started. Here's a close up of that canopy dieback. And again, these are very alarming symptoms, but by the time the disease has progressed to this point, that um, it often is actually noticed by homeowners or landscapers or anyone in the green industry, that tree is pretty close to dying at that point. Here's some trees that are further, further along. Um, in their infection. And what's also concerning is once these trees have been infected by thousand canker disease, they are then more vulnerable to other diseases as well as other abiotic stresses such as winter injury. Um, and these might be the things that actually kill off the tree. So unfortunately, these things don't exist in a perfect system and other pathogens are going to take advantage of a weakened and stressed tree. So there are lookalikes, as always, to these diseases, especially those that cause vascular stress. Um, Fusarium solani is one that we often see on walnut trees. And this particular fungus also likes to attack trees that are already infected with thousand canker disease. So unfortunately, it's kind of a one-two punch scenario where thousand canker disease gets there first, but then the fusarium is gonna come along and also help kill the tree. Armillaria root rot, responds the same, another fungal disease that will also help attack a stressed out tree. There are other insects that could be causing stress to these black walnuts, as well as root rots. Um, and then the myriad of abiotic diseases, you have drought, sunburn, freeze injury, root girdling, all sorts of things that could also kill trees. So for diagnosis, it is known to exist in Washington state, um, but it's really important if you see a plant that, or a black walnut or another walnut that you think, because there are other walnuts that can be infected, um, if you find a tree that you think is impacted, it's really important to reach out to Extension, WSDA, Department of Natural Resources, because we don't always know what counties have been impacted by this disease, so we need to keep an eye on where this disease may or not be, even though we know it's present in the West. Um, so report infest, suspect tree infestations, um, physical examination for confirmation if you can find the galleries along with the staining, um, and examine woody tissues for fungi. If you decide you wanna send in a sample to a laboratory, um, we need two to three inch in diameter pieces of branches that are cut to about six to 12 inches long. Um, and keep them in plastic bags so that they stay nice and moist and don't dry out before they get to a laboratory. Because most people don't actually live in eastern Washington where I'm located in Pullman. Um, and then you can send it to WSCA, Department of Natural Resources, um, as well as Puyallup. So walnut is a very desired woodworking uh, material. So the movement of walnut as wood and both firewood is suspected to help move this tree uh, move this disease into other areas of the United States. Luckily, the removal of the cambium or the bark tissue that removes the insects can reduce the amount of um, the likelihood of movement of this disease. 
but all, with always with firewood, burn it where you buy it. Do not move it. Um, but they have shown that as long as the cork or cork cambium has been stripped, does reduce the potential to move the insect, which then can move the fungi to other trees. Um, unfortunately, there's no way to stop the disease once it's progressed, which often results in needing to chip the trees. And usually you have to follow state and county rules on whether or not those wood pieces um, need to be kept on site. So in the place where the plant was found or if they can be moved to different disposal areas. Okay, next is the oldie but a goodie, white pine blister us. Um, so far, if there's anyone who's a mycologist at heart, there we've covered an omycete with Phytophthora, an ascomycete with um, thousand canker disease, and now we're moving into Phycidiomycetes. Phycidiomycetes are related or similar to a lot of the fungi we cook with, so that, um, such as our portobellos, or the ones that most people like to go foraging for. This unfortunately is a Phycidiomycete we don't like, um, and it was a fungus that was introduced from Europe to British Columbia, that then spread into the Pacific Northwest. Pathogens don't recognize political boundaries, so they have no problem moving across state and country lines. So the host, there's actually multiple hosts, again, kind of like the sudden oak death scenario, where there's five needle pines, so that's white bark, sugar, western white, eastern white, limber, bristled cone, as well as foxtail pines, um, with foxtails being more resistant to bristle cones, bristle cones being more resistant than limber. Um, these are, are what we call co um, commodity species. These are the ones we really care about. And then there's also a foliar host. So these are rivi species. So gooseberries as well as currants. Um, Indian paintbrush and lousewort have also been shown to be foliar hosts of this disease. Um, what's interesting is we must have both of these types of hosts to cause new infections. Um, which will be an interesting point when we start talking about the life cycle of this fungus. Okay, so again, here are our conifer, our um, white pine species that can all be affected. And then this is our foliar host. So this is a flowering current, um, the plant. And so this is the other host. It's the one that is not commercially planted or commercially used, unlike a lot of our pine species which are critical for the timber industry. Um, so this disease was so devastating that we actually started to remove ribes to prevent infection. Um, so when this disease first started spreading around, there was actually huge nationwide efforts to remove and destroy all currants and gooseberries. Um, they weren't aware that Indian paintbrush and louse wart yet were foliar hosts. But there are huge eradication efforts. Um, in my home state of Nevada, I remember as late into about 1998, they were still had efforts to reduce and remove currants and gooseberries. Now, it was Nevada, so they might have forgotten to take the signs down, but I still remember finding similar signs like this in the forest in Nevada. So this disease is interesting because it is a heteroecious macrocyclic rust. Um, that is nerd speak for it requires two different hosts to complete its life cycle, the white pines as well as the ribe species. Um, so that's what heteroecious means. Macrocyclic means that it has five different spore types that move the fungus. So most of the time we start with a basidiospore that has infected the needles of the white pine. It grows and overwinters to form a pycnia inside uh, usually on the bowl or the main stem of the tree that then develops into what we call acea which release acea spores and it sends these spores that infect ribes and then on the ribes we have the reproduction of a couple of different spore types that can spread but they only infect other ribes that is until we start to hit later in the summer where a spore we call telia develop and after these telia Telia and teliospores develop, we form basidiospores, which then start the infection all over again in the tree. 
So what the eradication efforts were aiming to do was to remove the rabies because white pine infections will not start white pine infections. It has, that fungus has to move on to the rabies and gooseberries for infection to take place on new infections to take place in white pines after that. So this is what rabies look like with some of the rust pustules. These are the uridiniospores. I often refer to this as Cheeto dust because if you took your finger along the back of it, you would get little yellow spores, little yellow to orange spores on the back of your hand. Um, one of the things to note is again, the spores develop on the underside of these rabies, but you can see on the top side of the leaf, yellow discolorations that are associated with these rust pustules on the other knee, underneath. So when you're out looking, that's what you're looking for. And then these are the telial horns. None of you can see me right now. Hopefully my webcam hasn't been on, but I'm making air horns with my hands. But they actually are projections that go outside of the leaf. And it is from these telial horns that the spores that can then infect uh, the white pines are released from. So that's the telial horns are the scary part of this fungus for white pines. And so then those spores often infect needles. And that's the part of the plant that they're actually able to cause infection on. What happens is the spores land, start infecting the needle, and then we start to see the fungus grow internally through the stems, through the branches, and eventually hitting the main bowl. And that's where we see this pycnia or this secondary structure then develop. Um, after it's moved from the needles through the branch into the main bowl, we start to see a canker. Oddly enough, these cankers are desirable to rodents. So they tend to eat out a lot of tissue around the cankers. So this is a canker that has been chewed on by rodents. Um, in the spring, a structure called acea develop. Because I'm a very technical scientist, I think this looks like popcorn. So if you start to see something that looks like popcorn on the bowl of a white pine, that's when you should be concerned that it has been infected by that particular fungus. So again, just a better representation of how this fungus is able to spread and colonize. In the winter, it survives as a pycneospore, usually as a canker on the main stem of the tree. It then develops into that popcorn-like structure on the tree. And then this is when it moves with wind and spring conditions onto the rabies. And once it's on the rabies, rabies is able to create spores that infect other rabies, progresses um, to the point that it develops into these telial horns. And then in the late summer, as we're starting into fall, that's when we see the spread again of these basidiospores that then infect the needles in the fall. So that's a more pictorial version of the different symptoms that we see um, throughout the season. So again, here's that yellow discoloration that's on the top side of the leaf that usually indicates that there's a foliar infection underneath. Here's some close-up of needle infection, um, usually kind of some yellow banding that is extended throughout the leaf. Um, the initial infection point might start to look a little more brown as the fungi grows through the needle into the stems. We can see these kind of spindle-like cankers. Um, we'll also see some ooze, some pycnidial ooze that can be associated with this fungus, especially when you see that spindle or kind of distorted um, shape to the twig. Now, if you are managing a forested area with your white pines, you do aim. So after fall infection has incurred, you wanna try and prune off those few needles that have been infected prior to the development of canker into the main bowl. So we wanna catch infection when it's on branches until before it has gone to the main bowl as we see here. So um, diligent pruning, keeping an eye on a lot of these things is very crucial. Um, some of the things we will see is this flagging. So again, one branch, it's almost waving at you with its yellow branch saying something's wrong. Um, we'll show discoloration. 
sometimes if the disease or a younger tree is infected, there's not a lot of opportunity to catch the infection before it gets to the main bowl. So we do see entire um, girdling, yellowing, and discoloration, as well as significant ooze and sap production. So with that, there are some takeaway thoughts in my mind. Um, Western white pine was such an important species to us in the Pacific Northwest um, for timber, for lumber, um, as well as being a critical part of the ecosystem. Um, and because it was a plant that had been in our soils for so long, it was actually less susceptible to the root rots and issues that are causing these replacement species that we've planted instead of white pine usually fail to. So things like our malaria, the heart and butt rots, that we lose a lot of plants that we've replanted, what used to be predominantly white pine, we still have failure from because we don't get to plant an important ecological species. So I think this is a great way to wrap up because think of how white pine blister rust destroyed our white pine based ecosystem. And the reason why we talk about these things and try and prevent them is think of how devastating thousand canker disease would be to the East Coast where black walnuts play such an important role in their ecosystem and the well being of their urban environments as well, as well as smoke death and how it could devastate ecosystems as well as industries. So if you see something, say something. If you're unsure of what to do or what you need, please give me a call. I'm always here, um, always available by phone, by email, and I can either guide you on what type of sampling you need to take, we can do some photo diagnosis if possible, and I can also connect you with the resource you need, whether that's Department of Natural Resources, WSDA, um, different extension agents, or the Puyallup Clinic, you know, reach out to someone and, and we'll find you. If I'm not the right person for you to talk to, I'll go and find you that person who is. Uh, contact extension, your university, state programs, and then utilize the Washington Pest Watch reporting app. These early detection is critical, especially for these diseases that we don't have in the region and we're trying to keep an eye out on. And even things like thousand canker disease that we know we have, it's important for us to see if it's spreading into other counties or if it's getting worse. So we really rely on first detectors to be involved and be the ones who catch these diseases first. So what to do if you suspect an invasive species, download the Washington Invasive Species app, contact local extension offices, contact an NPDN diagnostician, that's myself, Jenny Glass, and Jennifer Fallacy, and submit a physical sample. And please, please, please do not move firewood. And I know we've talked about a lot of trees. Um, it's very, very hard to put trees through the mail. You guys can't see me, but I'm about 5'4", on the best of days when I wake up first thing in the morning. And this is a nine-year-old blueberry plant that outweighs me by about 90 pounds. So don't worry about trying to dig up an entire white pine tree and send in a sample. Uh, go ahead and give the clinic a call first and we'll figure out what type of sample to send in or if we need to send someone out to you. And with that, thank you all for your attention and I will take any questions. Hmm. So if, if this is Justin Bush, if you have a question, um, either enter into the question box or raise your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, we've had some questions throughout the webinar and I'll, I'll read what we have. Um, the first question, are CEUs available for this webinar? I'm sorry to say that the webinar does not provide CEUs, um, but Rachel, this is a question for you. Where are commercial field kits available? Um, I know one is through AGDIA, A-G-D-I-A, um, Incorporated. I'm happy to send you a link. Let's see if I can actually pull it up. Um, but AGDIA is the one that a lot of us use for Phytophthora. Um, I believe there's also Pocket Diagnostic is another one. But if you shoot me an email, I'm more than happy to provide you with links and contact folks so you can get these commercial kits. And just so you're aware, those dipstick tests are about $2 a test. Um, but if you're coming in contact with a lot of these plants on a day-to-day -day basis, it really offers some peace of mind and is worth, uh, worth getting. Okay. 
If you have other questions, um, either enter it into the chat box or raise your hand. Um, uh, uh, so there's a, a question here. Is there a way to download the presentation slides for personal reference? And um, Rachel, I'd be happy to um, share the slides uh, via our website or share a link to the, the video recording. Are you okay with that? Yeah, absolutely. Great, so we will make that available following the webinar. Well, and if you guys have any questions, and again, I, you know, I really like working on invasive species. Um, but I'm also available for other questions, other issues with plant health. So please always feel free to reach out via email, give me a call, um, or check the diagnostic clinic website. There's a couple more questions. And someone has their hand raised. So someone has their hand raised. Um, we'll go ahead and unmute them. Yes. Uh can you talk a little bit about the bronze birch borer? The bronze birch borer is definitely an issue that we have in eastern Washington. From what I know, it is primarily targeting stressed out birches. So birch is widely planted. Sorry, there's some feedback. Um, birch is very widely planted because it grows very quickly. But we see issues with location. Um, Any time a birch tree is stressed out, it's more susceptible to that initial infection. So it's really critical to maintain birch tree health to prevent that initial infestation. Um, I believe pruning and then removing of any of those pruning tissues. So um, definitely the front birch door pay attention to keeping those trees as healthy as possible. And if you would like more information, please send me an email and I will send you some great WSU fact sheets on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rachel, we have uh, one more. Um, question uh so is phytophthora and i'm going to butcher this uh okay. <laughs> kerno vi vi is, i think i said it different every time i said it too yeah <laughs> so so is one phytophthora more dangerous than the other in our region you know that's an interesting question Sudden oak death is definitely the one on our radar more significantly because it's already in the U.S. Um, Pythothera kernovia has not been found in the U.S. So I would say sudden oak death is our bigger immediate threat, but it's worthwhile to keep an eye out for this other Pythothera. And just always remember, we do have native and endemic Pythotheras that have been here as well that are, are quite damaging but not that invasive, which just really can cause a lot of damage very quickly. Okay, we have uh, another question here. Uh, Rachel, do you know of some of the Coriolis species uh, if they're resistant to Eastern filbert blight? So I believe most of the filberts, mm, you know, that's, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if the person who asked that wants to shoot me an email, um, I'd be happy to send them information. I know, hmm. instead of giving out the wrong information, shoot me an email and I'll give you um, more information on it than you would ever possibly want. My apologies, I can't think of it off the top of my head, however. Okay, we, we have another question, Rachel. Uh, is is Phytophthora remorum found in the wild on Douglas fir? Um, not in Washington, and I don't believe it's been found on Doug fir in Oregon yet. I'm unsure about California, um, but we do know that it is a host for sun note death. So 
not in Washington, not in Oregon that I'm aware of, potentially in California, if it's within that quarantine zone. Well, we don't appear to have any other questions, Rachel. All right. <laughs> Great. Well, um, th thanks for joining us today. Um, and um, if, if you like this webinar, just be aware that this was the first in a series of webinars and in-person trainings that are part of the uh, Washington Pest Watch First Detector oh, Program. Wow. And um, if you uh, would like some more information on those events, please visit Invasive Species, period WAs in Washington, period GOVs in government, and click on Council Projects. And there's a full list there under Washington Pest Watch. So. Um, thank you all for your time and um, stay tuned for a recording as well as the PDF of the presentation. Thanks everyone. Thank you and if I didn't answer your question satisfactorily, please, please, please send me an email and I'm happy to give you as much information as possible. <laughs>